Hello everyone to this week's Bite Size Talk. I'm very happy to welcome today uh, Julia from Cubic in Tübingen and Marta from UPF in Barcelona. And they're going to talk about another new pipeline um, that was released just a week ago called CRISPR-Seq. And uh, off to you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. So we will present uh, NFCore CRISPR-Seq which is a pipeline for the analysis of CRISPR experiments. Um, so I would like to start by uh, an introduction to what CRISPR is, because I'm sure you've heard that word before, but maybe you don't remember exactly what it is. Uh, so basically this comes from bacteria and this system is um, repurposed to do gene editing. It consists of a protein that we call Cas, and this protein can cut uh, DNA, creating double strand breaks, and then it's coupled to a single guide RNA, which is basically a, a sequence, a short sequence of RNA, which is complementary to the DNA region that you want to cut. So this way we can have directed cuts. And then when when we have this double strand break in a cell, there are usually two mechanisms of of preparation. The most common one is this one that we call non-homologous engine. Um, so basically that's the cell that goes and tries to repair this double strand break and this can produce some insertions or deletions which can result in the disruption of the gene and then this can cause a gene knockout. And then there's a different way which is called homology directing repair, which consists on having a template um, that we can provide this template and then the reparation is made based on that template so we can introduce new fragments of the DNA and possible gen knock-ins. Um, then apart from these two, here in the right picture, of, apart from these two uh, mechanisms, um, there's also this micromology mediated um, engine, which is very similar to the nanomolecules, but it, it, it happens where there are two small regions of homology surrounding the cat, and then this can recombine so we can get a bigger deletion. And then more recently, there are these other two technologies called base editing and prime editing, which are done. Um, not by a double strand break, but only for um, with a nick. And those are more precise because can produce uh, base substitutions of only one base. So that's uh, the overview of all these CRISPR CAS experiments that we can have. Then apart from that, we can also have CRISPR screens, which consist of a library of different GRNAs targeting lots of different genes, and then we can perform a screening. And finally, also, if we couple uh, with a cas protein that's inactive and doesn't cut the DNA, and it only affects the, the expression of the gene, so then we call this CRISPR activation or CRISPR interference. So our pipeline, crispr seq can analyze gene knockouts, knock-ins, and also base editing or prime editing experiments. Um, so this pipeline is based on the first um, pipeline called CRISPR analyzer, which Marta developed, so she'll explain more about it. Yeah. As Julia has already said, um, this um, first release of NFCore CRISPR seq pipeline is based on CRISPR analytics. And currently we just have like the core of CRISPR analytics um, in CRISPR seq, which I will show you here. Um, this is these are like the core steps of that pipeline. This the first steps are um, this quality processing, pre-processing of the sequencing reads, where different steps are done to remove uh, low quality reads, and also in the case that we have um, paired and sequencing reads, the reads are are merged. Then. The alignment against the amplicon reference is done, and after that, there is a process 
where uh, each indel and substitution that could be led by, by these genome editing tools uh, are quantified. And finally, some plots and tables are done uh, to allow us to visualize the results. And in the next slide, what I want to show you is other optional steps that CRISPR analytics have that um, are not currently in crispr seq but we hope that we will be able to add it in the following versions. And just to go briefly, the first optional step that we have are the ability of using molecular identifiers to cluster the sequences. And through that clustering processes, we can um, <clears throat> remove sequencing and amplification biases, as well as correct uh, sequencing errors. We also have implemented um, an and a step that allows us to identify the amplicon reference, looking for it in a genome of reference. Then in the bottom part, you have two other steps that has allowed us to increase the precision of our pipeline. The first one is the size bias correction, in which we have implemented a simple model where we used um, spike in controls of different sizes and known um, abundance that were used to modelize biases related with the amplification with the sequence size. Since longer deletions will lead to have shorter sequences that will be amplified more times than longer ones. Then if we also sequence a um, mock sample or a negative control, um, we can use this sample to subtract errors that can be also represented in our treated samples. You can choose the alignment that you want to use in the alignment step, but we have uh, been exploring with uh, simulated data sets, the performance of different alignments together with the following part of quantifying the different edits. And, and then what we have done is to optimize that the parameters of uh, Minimap um, to achieve um, better results um, related to the identification of the indels produced with the, for, by the double strand break repair mechanism. And in the following uh, slide, we have just some examples of CRISPR analytics being used to analyze um, a bunch of samples. We have um, analyzed um, <clears throat> samples from three different cell lines that were edited with CRISPR-Cas9. And in the first plot, what we have, what we see is um, that the main pattern observed among all the insertions that have been found are homology insertions, which means that the same insertion that it's in the cleavage site have been also added to in this repair process. And this happens more, uh, um, it happens um, with higher frequency when the nucleotide that we have free is an adenine or a timine. Also in the other two plots, what we have been exploring is the <clears throat> precise outcomes, which are those outcomes that are shown in a higher frequency. In that case, we also observe that among these precise outcomes, we have these homology insertions, and also we have um, some deletions of a cytosine when this cleavage site is surrounded by cytosines, and also we can um, see some microhomology patterns that have lead to longer deletions that have also a high representative in these samples. CRISPR analytics have been benchmarking using several data sets. We have used um, real data 
as well as simulated data. And we also created a ground truth data set to, to be able to, to also have this kind of data set for the benchmarking. This um, ground truth data set was um, generated by several collaborators um, which had different subsets of reads and they were classifying um, the indels that were found in the reads as indels produced by errors or indels produced by genome editing tools. Finally, these subsets have been used to calculate the, the percentage of addition of those samples. And we have extrapolated this uh, percentage to be able to compare. Um, <clears throat> so to calculate the distance because between the percentages reported by different tools and the real distance or the established um, percentage of addition with this ground truth data set. And from this, we just want to highlight that our tool has a good precision without relying on the edition windows. Most of the tools use a windows where the edited indels have to take place to avoid reporting um, uh, false positive events. Okay. So how you can use NFCore CRISPR-C? Basically, you can use the typical Nextflow command where you provide an input sample sheet, the output directory or the profile that you want to run the pipeline with. And then we also have this one single parameter to provide the aligner. By default, um, we are using Minimap, but you can also choose between BWR, BWA or both title. And the reason why we don't have more parameters is because most of them are provided um, with the sample sheet because they are dependent on the sample. So that's how a sample sheet looks. Um, so you have the sample name, FASTQ1 and FASTQ2. If you have only single end sequencing data, you can only provide FASTQ1. Um, then you provide the reference sequence. Here it has been shortened for space issues. Um, so this reference is the reference where the reads will be aligned to. So it's um, the region where you directed your cat. Then you also provide the protospacer, which is the guide RNA that you used in your experiments to direct the cat. And finally, in case that you perform a normalization data per experiment, you can also provide that template. Um, and that's the structure of the output folder. I won't go to all the directors, uh, the directories specifically, but basically uh, you will find all the outputs of all the tools used for pre-processing, like the join, uh, parent reads, then so the quality filtering steps because we we remove sequencing adapters, we remove low quality reads or mask low quality bases also. And then you also have the output of the alignment. And finally, the most um, important folder, which is this one called SIGAR. Um, it's collected because we parse the edits using the SIGAR field from the mapping. Um, so here in these directories where you will find some tables and summary tables of the edits and also plots. And this is this is an example of the, the output plots. So we we'll report data quality, uh, meaning that you will have a percentage of uh, reads that had good quality, also the ones that were were aligned against the reference. Then we also report the number of reads that were wild type or the ones that contained indels. And from these indels, we also classified um, classified by a filter of, um, of um, also quality. And 
if they are in the are located in the expected uh, pickup from the cat size and if they are above the, the sequencing error rate or not. And finally, there's also a classification uh, between insertions, deletions, there are insertions produced by a template. And also if these indels are in frame or out of frame, because the ones that will be out of frame are the more probable to disrupt a gene function and produce a, a gene knockout. And finally, these further steps, as Marta already commented, that they are already implemented in CRISPR analytics. A, we will add them to, to CRISPR-Seq, so this uh, unimolecular clustering step to reduce uh, PCR duplicates or sequencing biases, because usually um, for the uh, sequencing methodology, shorter reads are sequencing sequenced um, more often. But this doesn't mean that you have this particular long deletion uh, more represented in your sample, so we can correct with human. Uh, then also the automatic identification of a reference and some noise handling. And finally, also thinking already with the version two, of course, for sake, and the idea is that we will be able to analyze other kinds of CRISPR experiments, such as CRISPR screening. So if you have any doubt or want to talk with us, Lohans is currently uh, implementing this part of the analysis, so you can join the, join the Slack channel and talk to us. And that's it. Feel free to, as I said, join the Slack channel and test out the pipeline and see if there's something that you would like to, um, to also include and also check, you can check the repository in GitHub. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Are there any questions in the audience to either Julia or Marta? Uh, you can unmute yourself now if you want to, or you can write uh, a question in a chat and I will read it out. There currently seems to be no questions, but may I ask one? <laughs> so one of the biggest issues that I know of CRISPR is off-target effects. Um, but as I understand, you're mapping to fairly short references, like just a target, basically. So is there any way how we could figure out if there are off-target effects with this pipeline, or is there anything planned in the future? Um, this pipeline is not really thought <clears throat> to be able to detect off target effects, but even that, what you can do, so this the experimental st um, steps are based on amplification of your expected target, and then you sequence with uh, Lumina or other sequencing uh, next generation sequencing platforms. And what you can do is, uh, for example, if you um, use some kind of prediction of which are the, the targets that are more susceptible to have off target, you, you can also amplify these off targets and, and use them or make the same analysis and see if there are in this, in that regions. But you would need to know what to look for then, obviously. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we should have to add guide seek or other kind of yeah. analysis pipelines that you use another kind of experimental protocol um, and also computational analysis. So it's it's something that that can be implemented um, in further steps. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions in the audience? Uh, if not, I would like to thank you too um, for this great talk. I also would like to thank the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative, who is funding our Bytesest talks. If anyone has more questions to both of you, you can always go to Slack and uh, check either in the channel for CRISPR-Seq, or you can also ask in the Bytesest channel. Um, and I'm pretty sure um, the two will have a look at your question. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.